All right. Well, thank you all for taking the time to come to honor uh, David and Cynthia today. And I'm really just going to provide a little personal color commentary um, about my uh, experience with David. And so, do I, can I come yes. in dry? So, um, as you've heard, David has had incredible number of successes, um, and I thought I'd start with one of his few failures. And that was in the education of fellows, as you heard from Sterling, he failed to teach Sterling how to fish, and similarly, <laughs> he failed to teach me how to fish. Um, and this is me, early on, you know, when I entered fellowship, listening to David try to explain to me how to fish. <laughs> the reality is, this is my son, out at Day Bob, <clears throat> catching a beautiful sea star. Um, all right, so what, uh, the other thing actually on reflection um, I realized was on the face of it, if you meet, if you met David and Cynthia, they seemed like very different people, um, sort of just temperament wise. But as I thought about it, they really are incredibly, from my experience, similar. So they're both incredibly wise. Uh, they're both fearless. They're both intimidating. <laughs> they were both incredibly kind and generous. And so I had the honor of getting both to work with David and eat din many dinners with David and Cynthia because they would take my, me and my family out. Um, and so I really, almost more than anything that David gave me, appreciated that time. <coughs> him uh, and Cynthia. The other thing I wanted to highlight is how far things have come since David's entry into the field. And so this is a paper from 1966. David, I don't know if you remember it. Um, but uh, this is about transillumination. And even to the last day he participated in our teaching rounds, he would still say, you know, you can still, if you don't have any other options to diagnose hydrocephalus, you can still transilluminate and it works. And so this is an early paper showing how to do that, complete with diagrams of the light at that time and um, how to configure things to get good images. And so the left image is the transillumination, the middle image is an air encephalogram, which was a very invasive procedure in contrast to just shining a light on the outside of the skull. And this is how far we've come. So now we can do fetal MRI and visualize things like spina bifida uh, in utero and be able to plan the care of uh, patients even before they're born. Um, and you'll hear a lot more about that uh, from Edith and Jay uh, in subsequent presentations. Um, and I, uh, very early on in my fellowship, uh, got to write a review article with David about uh, prenatal counseling uh, of women carrying fetuses with spina bifida. And that was really important in my career because it led to my participating in what is now the Fetal Diagnosis and Treatment Center here at Seattle Children's. Um, and we have counseled more than a thousand women carrying fetuses with a variety of central nervous system malformations. Uh, and what we have been able to tell women prenatally as it's incredible how much our knowledge has advanced over that time, both because of the improved imaging where we can actually see what's going on, but also because of uh, all the published literature on what happens to these fetuses during the pregnancy and beyond. Um, so again, just incredibly remarkable achievements that have, were built on the foundations that David uh, established during his career. Um, and so, the take-homes for me from David and Cynthia are, from David mainly, to publish if you want to be academically successful, to get grants. And David was very good at <coughs> getting money uh, for his division. And then be a fearless advocate for your patients, your college colleagues, and our work. And this is another picture of me and my kids, David and Cynthia, out at Day Bob. Uh, good memories. So. I'm a little bit nervous about being here. <laughs> um, I, I, I feel like, um, I guess, 
I feel like I'm the luckiest person um, in professionally because I've been a part of Seattle Children's and University of Washington since 1979 uh, when Judy Hall brought me out from Sarah Lawrence to be a genetics counselor in the prenatal diagnosis clinic. And at that time, it was, I was 0.6 prenatal diagnosis and 0.4 pediatric biochemical genetics. genetics. And so I've always crossed back and forth between Seattle Children's and the um, University of Washington. And I think that in this career, I've also had really the privilege of seeing this entire circle of life, from counseling moms to being the prenatal diagnosis um, MFM to now um, taking care of some of the moms that I delivered. Uh, and I learned all of this really under the guidance of some super, super giants in um, developmental uh, biology, in uh, birth defects, in genetics. And many of them are sitting in this room, including Dr. Shirtliff. And although he and I really didn't um, work together directly, um, his work in um, spina bifida and taking care of our kids with spina bifida has really allowed us um, to take care of these moms and have these moms in our community um, just be very happy, functional people. And um, so I just credit this relationship with each other um, to bring us full circle. And I hope that I will give you some data today um, to kind of get that feeling. I will warn you that it's a little bit data heavy. I want um, because it's you know it's kind of a combined talk for urology and um, OB as well. That there's just some key points that I'd like you to hopefully um, have out of this. So I haven't used a this for a long time. So do I? Focus. Okay. Before we start, um, I always think about what I do, what we do in prenatal diagnosis, and 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 that is that. We can never understand what's happening with the fetus without getting access to the fetus. Um, and so everything that we've achieved in all of these decades in genetics um, and really um, developmental biology, if you will, um, is also predicated upon our ability to sort of access the fetus in this way, from indirectly through imaging, as Dan has talked about, to direct access through amniocentesis, um, fetal cortisynthesis, getting fetal blood. Um, in the old days, I actually had to do a fetal biopsy a couple of times because we were dealing with some stores disorder and we didn't know how to, we didn't have any genes. So we actually like sampled a little bit piece of a fetal liver. Um, so to now fetal surgery therapy, and of course moving even before the fetus, getting to the embryo or the blastocyst, if you will is all the pre-implantation testing that's available. And on the other side is, of course, getting all of this tissue at different aspects of the fetus or the development of the zygote embryo fetus is that we're actually getting a window into the genetic mechanism, potentially, that governs um, what is happening to the fetus, both at the normal level but at the <coughs> abnormal level along the way so you actually get a window into this. And of course, the latest is that because of cell-free DNA, we are now understanding that the mom and the baby talks to each other and vice versa through um, our evaluations, investigations, and cell-free DNA. It's super cool. I'm so sorry that I'm getting so old that I won't be here to enjoy the rest of this because it's just so much fun work to do. But. The other thing, concept that I want us to think about now, because I think a lot of people still think about prenatal diagnosis as getting, or pre-genetic screening as, you know, I've got the pregnancy. But this is full circle. Where do we begin? We can begin at any point now in genetic screening, and that's what we do every single day, right? So the history of prenatal management of neural tube defects. 1956 was when alpha fetal protein was identified in the human fetal serum. Uh, in the 1970s, it was identified um, or discovered that elevated maternal serum AFP um, was associated with an open neural tube defect. And then with the um, development of um, amniocentesis, which was sort of in the late 70s, 
um, we were able to um, measure amniotic fluid AFP. It's <coughs> elevated in open spina bifida, but more specifically, um, the uh, identification of um, acetylcholinesterase in the amniotic fluid basically cinched this. Now, why is this important? Because you have to understand, if you look, it was not until 1980 that we actually had ultrasound. I remember, and Nancy Shirtland was there with me, that we were doing amnios blindly at that time. Yes, we had one ultrasound. It was a big <coughs> remote, it was a box that was this big. I think I can say it, share it here. We shared it with the animal lab down in the basement of the university. And on amniocentesis day, I would march down there and roll this box up, kind of wipe it down, and we would do, and we would, we would go ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. Yes, there's a pregnancy. And then that was that. Okay. So, so ultrasound was a big deal for us. And really, um, it was really not until 1986 that the landmark discovery of a paper from um, Nicolaides um, et al., including Dr. Um, Steve Gabby, who was um, our chair um, at the U in the 1990s, that really specifically sorry, that really specifically said that the lemon sign and the banana sign are so sensitive and so specific for an open neural tube defect, so that oftentimes you would see this on ultrasound before we even saw the neural tube defect or even before the AFP came back um, elevated. So that made a really big difference for us. And then finally, as you have talked about, the landmark um, paper that reported on um, the use of um, folate um, four milligrams uh, prior to uh, conception reduced the risk of um, neural tube defects in women who are at, um, who are at increased risk for neural tube defects. And then um, in 1996, the FDA, the FDA basically uh, mandated fortification of um, uh, of all of our foods. And I remember Dr. Michalski um, basically. Um, uh, be, you know, meeting in front of Congress and um, basically discussing the rationale for all of this. So, moving forward to delivery and what do we do? So, first thing is that, you know, we got the prenatal diagnosis, but gosh, how do we deliver these kids? How do we deliver these fetuses? And we really didn't know. Um, and it was really this landmark paper in 1991, um, through the work, collaborative work of um, our Seattle Children's um, and our university um, faculty, and you, I think you can recognize the names here, um, that really looked and said that um, prophylactic, if you will, um, cesarean delivery of fetuses with neural tube defects basically improved um, their neurological kind of um, outcome by about two levels. And um, it was there are lots of issues with that study, I totally agree, but there was nothing else in the literature. And this really set the stage for delivery of fetuses with neural tube defects for several decades. Okay. Um, and so and it was in nineteen in twenty eighteen, this is the paper that basically is a meta-analysis um, and review um, of delivery outcomes based on that, you know, comparing vaginal versus C-section. And this paper basically said, no, it really doesn't make a difference. Either way is fine. And so it's through that that we've changed now the way that we think about delivering our fetuses with neural tube defect. And so at this time, we always strive for term delivery. Um, we don't want to add prematurity to already um, issues that the baby has. Um, and C-section is not associated with any significant with a C, uh, reduction in risk for infant death compared to vaginal birth. Um, and, and I want to kind of ask you that by saying that back in the day um, when we worked with our, with, with our pediatric neurosurgeons, there was some concern that a vaginal delivery, particularly a prolonged, what we call second stage of pushing, if the um, neural tube, open neural tube defect should um, rupture, that there was an increased risk for infection because of the vaginal bile, right? Um, so, so now, currently, the candidates for vaginal delivery are the usual stuff. The baby should have a normal size head. 
um, that the lesion is unlikely to cause dystocia. Some of the super large ones may not um, you know, be candidates. That the baby obviously is cephalic presentation and that there are no obstetrical indications for a C-section. But at the end of the day, the mode of delivery is still a shared decision making, right, between all of us um, and, the, um, and the parents. So prenatal diagnosis. So I alluded to the fact that I, this is a journey of having um, an affected fetus, of having you guys at, uh, up here at Seattle Children's taking such good care of our children. Um, and that our moms and our, our, our women are healthier, they're in great shape, and they are doing well, and they are now in their 20s and 30s, and they want to have babies. And so this is the continuum. So if you look at the literature in terms of pregnancy outcomes in women with spina bifida, I did a very quick search. Um, there aren't that many. And that makes total sense. Um, and most of the papers really um, came out in the last five to seven years. And again, that totally makes sense because we now have a group of women now in which we can study. We also have all the databases that you know, we can gather because any one institution only has a handful of um, deliveries with spina bifida, um, women with spina bifida. I'll give you just a, an inkling of the titles, though. The first um, paper um, that was that I could find was in the 1970s, and if you look at the if you look at the titles, handicap and social status, continents, friends, marriage, children. Okay, um, and in, and it was actually very heartwarming to look at, in particular, the 1974 um, paper, 202 individuals with spina bifida between 1933 and 1953, 108 women, right down here. But the things they were looking at were lost of or delayed in schooling because of um, lack of college opportunities. Um, they recognized that of the rare adult women who had some urinary um, um, diversions, they had great improvement in their lives, but many did not have the opportunity. Um, they talked about not having access to specialty centers, so here, look at us. Um, and bladder and kidney infections, um, clothing challenges. But among this group, there were 105 children. Um, what they didn't do is break it out into how many were from women and how many from men, which was interesting to do. But there were two with, um, uh, sort of, uh, with a neural tube defect. So it really wasn't until, this is, 2000 was really the first big paper that looked at something, um, some um, kind of concrete outcomes. And again, 207 women born between 1945 and 75. There were only 23 reported pregnancies. And again, kind of the same thing. Um, there were, you know, antenatal admissions were um, higher uh, in compared to women who were not. There were stoma problems, um, reduced mobility, their pre-existing pressure sores. And also I have to remember that that was a time where we didn't have all the surgical advances that you that we have really um, evolved so that many of our moms are women with spina bifida were wheelchair dependent i remember you know taking i, I remember that um, so very clearly that i really didn't have anyone who was particularly who was ambulatory so we sort of have to remember all of this but i think for as, as an obstetrician um, it was good to see that still um, vaginal deliveries um, were an option, but they didn't have to have a C-section. And in fact, in our women with um, spinal cord injuries, including spina bifida, vaginal deliveries are actually the preferred mode if we can do that, because it's actually surgically safer for the mom. Okay. Um, so, so you can see that we jumped from 2000 to 2019 because now we actually have a body of women that we can actually study with some concrete data. And what we see basically is that um, there is an increased risk, uh, uh, incidence of um, C-sections. Um, some of it is because their babies are, are breached because particularly our moms who are um, wheelchair um, dependent, I have found that their pelvises are actually sort of underdeveloped 
And so they, it's difficult. Um, and also, we are unable to manage their pain during labor um, because of their spinal cord injury. So we do, and some of the women have, you know, neobladders, um, urinary di um, diversions. And if we had to do an emergency C-section, that would actually be very, would be too, uh, potentially complicated. So I just kind of want people to know that. Um, we do have a higher incidence um, of um, preterm delivery less than 37 weeks, although we're moving towards more and more of the late preterm deliveries as opposed to the true 26, 28, 27 week deliveries. Um, again, um, I, I highlight some of these in red because this is a constant theme and it hasn't changed in the last 20 years in taking care of women with spina bifida in their pregnancies, and which is renal, 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 renal. Bladder infections and pilo all the time. Um, and um, occasionally some, um, some v VP shunt malformation replacement, generally related to the fact that as the uterus advances, the tip of the shunt down in her pelvis can get obstructed. Um, and so we do have, you know, so there's that. But this is the common theme. All the other stuff is actually pretty consistent over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, as we um, have heard, um, our kids are um, surviving to adulthood. They're doing better. So we have a large number of relatively healthy, healthy um, adults with spina bifida. And this is a Canadian study um, that sort of shows this, um, uh, this increase of um, prevalence of um, deliveries of women with spina bifida per 1,000 infants um, in Quebec. Uh, and, 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 I, and as you can see, the majority of the births occur in um, women um, between this age range, which makes sense. And you can see that um, as the years go by, our, um, the number of women who with spina bifida um, uh, entertaining pregnancies increase in the number of children. So we have some women now who are coming back to their second pregnancy. But this is a two, so again, same theme. 20 years ago, it was kidneys and bladder infections. 20 years later, it's still the same thing, which is what I see um, clinically at the front line. This is a paper that's local. It comes out of the University of Washington Seattle Children's. Um, and it's a look, it's just looking at um, the, uh, our, our local experience. And what we found was that, um, so there are 179 women um, with spina bifida with pregnancies. Um, and what they saw, of course, was that, um, you know, they needed intensive prenatal care. Um, again, urinary tract infections. Um, and some level of preterm labor, preterm delivery. Um, preterm delivery here. Um, malformation rate was about um, two, uh, the relative risk was about twofold, um, either for neural tube defect or other mid, interestingly, other midline abnormalities. So there was a cleft palate and then there was an afferent seal. Um, I like this study because it is a qualitative study. So, and, and what happens in clinic is that moms are going to say, or during their pregnancy, they're going to say, oh, I can't get my catheter in my stoma. It's, you know, it's, I'm just, and I have to cath more. Is this going to change when I, after I deliver? Um, for moms who are ambulatory and who we are thinking um, and expecting a vaginal delivery, the issues that they have are, are difficulties with voiding um, with pregnancy because as the uterus grows, it changes the angle of the urethra and the bladder so they can't void as quickly and easily. They want to know, am I going to, is this going to still say, this is a pain in the rear end? Um, the other issue is something called pelvic floor relaxation or uterine descensus. So I think that because of the neurological issues, um, in the pelvis as vis-a-vis -vis our um, lumbosacral, for example, um, abnormalities, 
I do think that embryologically, the development of the pelvic floor is not as strong. And so our moms with um, spina bifida who become pregnant do um, uh, experience what we call uterine descensus. And that can be problematic. And they want to know, is this going to continue after I have this baby? And so this was a paper that was really helpful because they're qualitative. They're things I can say to moms. That at the end of the day, although it's very small, if you look at, you know, in particular this, um, return, uh, if you had full function in terms of your ability, you're going to return to baseline. Um, if you had some wheelchair, you're going to return to baseline. You're going to return to baseline. You're going to return to baseline. Okay. Um, it's very, very important for them to hear these qualitative words and that you have a paper to support that, even though it's a small paper. Same with, um, same with their bowel issues um, and their catheterization issues. So, um, so I found this paper to be super helpful. Okay. We cannot deliver our moms comfortably and safely without our help with, um, uh, with anesthesia. And so we know that neuraxial anesthesia is possible for our women with spina bifida. It just takes a lot of preparation because our OB anesthesia colleagues need to help us, need to know what's going on in their spine and whether they can get that catheter in. And we do not want to know that when she is laboring or we do not want to know that as we want to roll her in the operating room for a C-section. So it's planning, planning, planning. And as this case report demonstrated, um, thorough approach to pre-existing clinical features, detailed examination, and Im imaging of extent of lesion is critically <coughs> important and is the shared decision making and should not be done during labor. So I just want to quickly say that the the other thing that's coming up, and I think that you guys know about this as a function of our program here, is that our young people are asking about more conversations about my sexual health, my sexuality, my, my, my ability to conceive, um, and all of that planning. So I just put some of this up here for you. Um, so at, in summary, I think that you know pregnancy in women's spina bifida is successful. Um, it's encouraged if they want it, um, but there needs to be a pre-pregnancy consult. It's a multidisciplinary team, um, folate. Some of our women have infertility because of all the abdominal adhesions, because of all the surgeries they might have had, particularly on moms who have had you know, urinary um, diversions or revisions and things, right? Um, I actually have a mom who, um, I know I finally delivered her last year, but it was a five-year pregnancy because, and she went from non-AMA to advanced maternal age. <laughs> um, and again, her reason for infertility was really all of her adhesions because she had so many um, revisions. Um, so, um, prenatal guidance is planning. Um, as, as an obstetrician um, slash surgeon, um, we have to know these, the, the surgical path of previous surgery so that we know how to get into this with into her abdomen without damaging all the work that's been done previously. So we have to understand what, um, what the surgical roadmap is. The other is particularly with our moms with bladder augmentation with trophonops. Um, they often um, have um, you know, a microbiology profile that's baseline. And so we have to understand that so that we know when we should react for infection versus not. So I think that all of these things are super important. Um, pregnancy management, we have a whole protocol um, at the U for how to take care of our moms. Um, and um, postpartum is individualized assessment for postpartum depression. And I also pretty, um, point out PTOT consult for newborn care, depending on what uh, mom's ambulation capabilities are. We need to prep for all of those things for her. First, you know, I didn't have the pleasure of working with Dr. Sertin, if I did have the pleasure of working with the other Dr. Sertin. And I just want to say that she exemplifies everything that I've heard that you exemplify throughout your career. 
brilliant, committed, uh, dedicated, logical, analytical, you taught her well. Um, and uh, the other thing I wanted to say was that when I interviewed here both for fellowship and subsequently as faculty, Dr. Ellen Bogan and Dr. Ojanin really exemplified the importance stated in the working relationship with the neurodevelopmental program. Both interviewing here for fellowship and subsequently as faculty, I remember distinctly meeting with Bill and colleagues, and it just really shows proof and principle how important your work is to what we do, and how important Dr. Lose or Dr. Ellen Bogan, Dr. Ojanin felt it was that everyone needed to meet Bill Walker. Um, what I was going to do in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is just run through neurosurgical management of myelomeningocele in the post moms era. A lot has happened over the last five years, and it has changed the way that we take care of these children. And Edith really alluded to that, and so did Dan, and so did Bill. I'm just going to take us over the finish line here. So we all know that myelomeningocele essentially is a full thickness defect in the spine resulting in herniation of both the spinal cord and its coverings, and there are significant CMS sequelae. Hydrocephalus, by far and away, is the most problematic of all the CMS sequelae. It is lifelong, it is challenging to treat, it is fought with complications. The QRA2 malformation, though usually is clinically quite uh, quiet, can occasionally be life-threatening. Uh, cerebral myelia, intellectual dysfunction, lower extremity dysfunction, and everything that comes along with this with bowel and bladder are all things that everyone in this room has spent their career uh, taking care of. Um, from a neurosurgical perspective, shunt dependence by far and away is one of our greatest challenges. There's a high likelihood of shunt revisions over the child's lifetime. There's shunt-related morbidity, i.e. infection and other things. And there's a tremendous cost to both the family and the healthcare system. Intellectual disability, including those related to school and the ability to work later in life. The QRE2, which rarely can be acutely symptomatic, but when it is, can be life-threatening. And then, of course, uh, the deficits that result from the herniation of the spinal cord and its coverings, which are limb, bowel, and bladder dysfunction. And particularly relevant to neurosurgery is um, the retethering risk. I don't know where that is. The retethering risk. And to what Bill was saying earlier, our neurodevelopmental colleagues are just so incredibly talented at having these conversations before the patients meet us. My first month here, I met a child who was retethered, and I immediately started to go into my spiel about like retethering, and the mom stopped me and was like, oh, don't worry, Dr. Walker covered this already. We're just here to book the surgery. And I'm like, all right, sounds good. <laughs> and the truth was, he had already said everything that needed to be said. Um, in our current postnatal repair paradigm, what we do here, uh, ideally, we try to identify these lesions in utero. We do have some moms that have poor antenatal care, may not even have a mild meningocele diagnosed before they see us, but most of the time we try to identify them, see them in clinic so that Dan or Hannah Tully can do it and Edith can do a phenomenal job um, counseling them. And then we do neuroimaging uh, before and after delivery. We try to close the defect within 48 hours, mainly to mitigate, mitigate the infection risk. And we use our plastic surgeons here because they're incredibly talented and they help us reduce the risk of CSF leak. We try to treat the hydrocephalus in the 80 or so percent of children who require treatment. There are some very relevant current questions about the best way to treat hydrocephalus in these children. For most of your careers in this room, it was ventricular peritoneal shunting. That is changing. And more and more children are being offered what's called the endoscopic third ventriculostomy or cord plexus cauterization, oh. which is an endoscopic-based procedure in which an ETV or perforation in the bottom of the third ventricle occurs, and the cord plexus are coagulated. And I can talk to you about that, but that's out of data that is now over a decade old from Eastern Africa. Um, where a guy named Ben Worf, who's now at Harvard, um, realized very quickly when he had gone there to do missionary work, shunts were not possible. They just they, they couldn't be afforded. Um, if they needed a revision, there was not going to be a replacement. So he spent a good chunk of his career in Uganda developing this technique and then publishing it. And there's a lot of questions about how well it works in North America. And then, of course, there's the very important things that you guys do. Home teaching, neurodevelopmental follow-up, lifetime monitoring of the shunt, 
Zerlomyelia, retether, and all these things. The Mons trial changed everything. It took about five years, I think, for it really to change things, as most pivotal scientific studies do. But in 2011, the uh, trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the pivotal centers were going to be CHOP, uh, UCSF, and uh, Nashville, Vanderbilt. And realized that Vanderbilt, in particular, had been doing antenatal myelomeningocele surgery since the late 80s. So there, uh, starting with Bruner and then Noel Tulipan, they had been working on perfecting the technique for close to 20 years before the Mons trial was published. And it was very edgy when they were first publishing their data to the point where what was mentioned earlier to the foundational work of Dr. Shirtliff and others it needed to be rigorously studied, and that was the foundation that the Mons trial was laid on. This is a picture of what it looks like. There's a hysterotomy. The baby is brought to the surface. This is the open repair. The mitral meningocele is closed almost fundamentally no differently than we do it postnatally, except the baby is in mod while it's happening. And of course, you can imagine the tremendous complexity that that ensues. Okay? In this trial, there were 183 women that underwent randomization. It was 90 and 90, and about 70 in one group, 64 in another group made it through the entire trial for analysis. And, and I, I would just point out a couple things that came out of the MOMS trial that subsequently have been very rigorously studied and have sort of held up. We'll talk about that. Placement of a shunt. Traditionally, everything that we knew about myeloma and Ingusil, based on a lot of work that was done here by Dr. Shirtliff and colleagues, um, demonstrated to us that about 80% of children required CSF diversion after having their myeloma and repaired. In the MONS trial, that number dropped to 40%. This is almost a 50% reduction in the number of kids that required CSF diversion. The other very compelling thing that came out of this trial was near near universal reversal of hindbrain herniation. And while most of the time the QRE2 is not symptomatic, radiographically a significant number of these kids had reversal of their QRE2 after the mobs. Um, there was a suggestion that there was improved functional outcome. That is a little bit less clear in the post moms era as to whether there's improvement in motor sensory and neurological function. It's a question. Uh, but it did appear that more kids were walking independently after antenatal closure than after postnatal closure. And this is kind of a summary of what I just said. A couple things that have been looked at in detail since that time. Looking at functional outcomes, it appears that those that were antenatally repaired probably have a degree of improved mobility and improved independent functioning uh, compared to those children who were not repaired antenatally, and there were fewer shunts in that group, and we can talk about that. That's a complicated, that's a complicated issue. Um, orthopedic outcomes. It appears that the mom's cohort versus the non-mom's cohort, there were no differences in rates of like scoliosis, kyphosis, clubfoot, tibial torsion. There may have been lower rates of leg length discrepancy in the prenatally repaired group, and lower rates of casting or bracing. The problem with this data, like a lot of data in the post-mom's era, is everyone that sees that child knows they were repaired antenatally. And there is an intrinsic bias in management of children who are known to be repaired antenatally. Why? Because the doctor immediately thinks the outcomes are probably a little bit better. You were antenatally repaired. I read the mom's trial. The outcome should be better. Maybe I'll wait a little bit longer before I cast or I brace, or I do that orthopedic intervention, or I shunt the child, which is actually very relevant to the hydrocephalus conversation. Urological outcomes, probably not any different, postnatal versus antenatal closure. Um, hydrocephalus. Everyone seems to be convinced that the MOMS trial resulted in reduction in hindbrain herniation. I think that if you ask most people who've reviewed the data, we're all pretty convinced of that, okay? The hydrocephalus piece is a little more nuanced for the reason that I just mentioned. When to intervene on hydrocephalus is not universally, uh, uh, it's not a universal definition among all neurosurgeons. 
Some people will intervene based on ventricular caliber alone. Some people will wait until the child is fulminantly symptomatic. Some people fall somewhere in between. If you saw a child who was known to be antenatally closed and had ventricular megaly that was asymptomatic, the surgeons were probably more likely going to sit on that child. Asymptomatic with ventricular megaly. Whereas in the postnatal repair, it seems that the threshold is probably lower to intervene on ventricular megaly alone. Plus, you have a fresh surgical wound back here that can leak CSF. And so in the antenatal repair, that's mostly not an issue, but in the postnatal repair, it is. And one of the ways you treat CSF leak is your place to shunt. And so the threshold to shunt these babies is probably a little bit lower in the postnatal repair. Whether or not these results are going to hold up in the long term is unclear. I think that there's really no debate that the shunt rates are probably lower in kids who get an antenatal repair. How much lower is that due to the surgeon's threshold for intervention versus the actual, you know, um, biochemical physiologic reduction of hydrocephalus? That's not super clear. But that and the hindbrain herniation, I think, are indisputable. The fact that the child is likely to have improved mobility and improved activities of daily living is probably also indisputable. That magnitude of effect is a little unclear. The urological stuff, less clear. So early data is suggesting that this probably holds up over time. We just don't know what that magnitude of effect is going to be. And I'm going to close on this because this is really relevant to discussions that are being had right now. The MOX trial is only about 12 years old. Almost no centers are actually even repairing the way the MOMS trial would repair them anymore. Most centers are moving what's called a fetoscopic approach, which is doing it endoscopically, not through an open hysterotomy, but either through a small hysterotomy or percutaneous. So that data, that, that, that really is the best data that we have in antenatal repair, which is only 12 years old, no one's even really repairing that way except CHOP. And even CHOP isn't really repairing the same way they did in the MOMS trial. So there's almost light speed advancement in our OBGYN colleagues' ability to access the uterus, access the fetus, and do surgery antenatally that, that is really outpaced our ability to even do meaningful clinical trials to compare. So the best data that we have, this is a meta-analysis. I'm going to skip it to the last slide. This is an open registry of all fetoscopic repairs. This was only published a year ago. And what they were doing is they were just looking at open versus fetoscopic repair of myelomeningocele. They tried to cohort, they tried to match the cohorts. And they found that after open fetal surgery, all the patients were being developed by C-section, whereas in the fetoscopic registry, one third were being developed vaginally. That's a really big deal. Um, and that there were significantly lower rates of uterine dehiscence in the fetoscopic group, which is an issue with the open laparotomy. It seems like it probably is as effective from a mom's myelomeningocele standpoint as the open repair. Um, and the shunting rates and, and the uh, motor outcomes seem to be pretty similar. So it really just becomes an issue of stopping the CSF leak in a way, antenatally versus postnatally. And I'll stop there. I apologize if I nope. talked too long. Perfect. Yeah. So as Bill said earlier, we're bringing up uh, uh, some of our, our uh, former fellows. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Craig McDonald. Uh, he was uh, quite a star student and resident when he was here. He's currently the professor and chair of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and professor of pediatrics and director of the uh, MDA Neuromuscular Disease Clinics at uh, UC Davis. And he has uh, carved himself quite a career. So uh, we will let Craig, Craig, Craig take it away. Greetings from, from Davis, California. It's, it's really an honor and privilege uh, to be asked as one of uh, David Sherliff's former trainees to provide some reflections on the impact that he in particular and, and Cynthia has had on my career, which is focused on providing medical and rehabilitation management for children with disabilities. And, and I can say really with assurance that there has been no single mentor 
uh, which has had a bigger impact on my career in academic medicine than, than Dr. David uh, Shirtliff. Uh, and my reflections date back to my years growing up in, in Seattle, uh, where I was born in, in 1959, just, just prior to David and Cynthia uh, relocating uh, to Seattle from, from Boston. My mother, who was a high school biology teacher for 35 years uh, at um, Mercer Island High School, used to take her high school students on field trips in the 1970s uh, to Seattle Children's Hospital for, for immersive experiences in the management of children with birth defects. And she used to come home and tell stories of this physician who looked like a, a Marine or a sailor who had just gotten <laughs> off an aircraft. Uh, who, was, who was really so uh, impactful and destructive. Uh, she described, uh, uh, he described impactful issues pertaining to infants with spina bifida, ethical issues, medical issues, life issues. She was really impressed with how effective he was at getting the attention of the misbehaving students in the back row uh, during the uh, presentations. But, uh, and Cynthia would, would describe quality of life and advocacy issues um, to the mother's high school students. And in 1975, nearly 50 years ago, I boarded a yellow school bus and took my first trip to Seattle Children's and participated in one of these community outreach and educational activities for high school students. Uh, I saw a baby with spina bifida for the first time, uh, and I was just so inspired by Dr. Shirtliff uh, that I, I really set a goal uh, at that point to go into medicine, and ultimately I helped to provide care for children with birth defects and disabilities. And in 1983, uh, 40 years ago, I entered the University of Washington School of Medicine uh, and sought out a research project in pediatric disability in rehabilitation medicine uh, with Ken Jaffe, a former chief resident and division chief of pediatric rehab at the time. And uh, Dr. Jaffe got me in touch with David Shirtliff. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Shirtliff initially immersed me in a clinic with the pediatric physical therapist. Uh, and subsequently, we embarked on a series of research projects focusing on uh, describing patterns of neurosegmental innervation in myelomeningocele. Uh, and because of aberrant neurulation, uh, it, the patterns differ from Professor Sherrard's original description of neurosegmental innervation. And our first series of papers was published in, in 1986, uh, 30, 37 years ago when I was a third year uh, medical student. Uh, and, and David really taught me a number of important lessons, and, and uh, it was, it was some, one was that really there was something to learn uh, from all our patients in, uh, in clinic uh, as we approach clinical research. Uh, he immersed me in the clinic uh, initially and exposed me to the concept of the electronic uh, computer database. Uh, and really, I think he had a visionary concept of the electronic medical record. Uh, at the time, and I began collaborating with others involved in the Multicenter International uh, Myelodysplasia Study Group, or, or IMSG. Uh, I really learned uh, that coming to clinic uh, and providing uh, quality care to patients uh, was also tantamount to, uh, you know, for a research investigator, a basic scientist, you know, coming to the lab and, and uh, coming to clinic was really coming to the clinical laboratory where compassionate and competent care and clinical research could really coexist. Uh, and I learned also about the power of international uh, collaborations. Uh, Hillary uh, Shirtliff uh, previously mentioned family work, uh, service, and play. Uh, and David and Cynthia were such great role models for a young family member, uh, for a young family entering uh, a career in academic medicine. And as a student, uh, David and Cynthia welcomed my, my wife and I into their home, uh, took us to fishing trips to Daybob Bay. Uh, Cynthia was such, was such a beautiful person, uh, and she taught me the importance of including advocacy groups, families, patients with disabilities uh, in, in the research process for their perspectives they provided. And David uh, also uh, arranged that I travel for my, it was really the first time I ever traveled out of the country as a fourth year medical student uh, I traveled with him and Cynthia uh, so that I could present my work in Belfast, Ireland to the Society for Research into Hydrocephalus and Spina Bifida, where I presented my work in front of uh, Sherard himself, uh, who congratulated uh, me on the, on the work, uh, you know, as a, as a fourth-year medical student. 
Uh, and then when it came to residency training, uh, David, who always placed his mentees' interests first and foremost, committed that I pursue training in both pediatrics and physical medicine and rehabilitation. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, that might be a better option than pursuing uh, a career, given my interest um, uh, in something like developmental pediatrics. So I went away to UCLA to pursue a pediatrics residency uh, where my wife is doing a postdoc, and I returned to Seattle to do my PM&R residency. Uh, and during my uh, final year residency, I was able to work as a chief resident in pediatric PM&R, and I. I did a one-year continuity clinic every week with David in the birth defects clinic uh, where he taught me really how to primarily manage children with myelodysplasia. And I, I was just so impressed with the way he interacted with teenagers with spina bifida on issues pertaining to educational or vocational planning, community integration, recreation, issues of sexuality and fertility. Uh, I also participated with him in prenatal discussions with families where he was for what life would be like uh, for a child with spina bifida. And he provided really, uh, I, I think, accurate information in a, in a non-judgmental uh, fashion for these uh, families that were trying to make decisions. And when I was ready to start my career in academic medicine, I was faced with the decision to stay in Seattle uh, as a fourth faculty member in pediatric rehab or start a pediatric rehab program at UC Davis in Sacramento. Uh, where a, a state-owned-funded tenure-track uh, faculty position was offered. And David really suggested I take the opportunity at the University of California system uh, and take the faculty position at UC Davis. And I've been here uh, ever since for 31 years. Uh, it's been a wonderful career here, and I'm, I'm really indebted to David for his uh, guidance. Uh, I've been chair of pm r at UC Davis for the past uh, 14 years. And our department of PM&R has grown from five faculty to 26 uh, faculty uh, during that time. Uh, I've been involved in spina bifida clinic here uh, in our Shriners Hospital system in Sacramento for 25 years where we followed between 300 and 400 children with spina bifida. Seven years ago, I was able to transition that clinic leadership uh, to one of my early career faculty members who's now involved in the fetal surgery uh, cure trial uh, run by uh, Professor Diana Farmer, Chair of Surgery at UC Davis, the same PI who ran the, ran the mom's trial when she was at UCSF. Uh, and my faculty member is now involved in the, uh, the, the CURE trial. It's a cellular therapy for, for uh, in utero repair of myelomeningocele. Uh, it's a trial of placental mesenchymal stem cells seated on a commercially available dural graft uh, extracellular matrix uh, along with fetal repair. Uh, and this uh, model was uh, originally developed in a large animal dam. Like Jeff McLaughlin uh, in the MOMS trial, I, I currently serve on the DSMB for this uh, CURE trial. So there's been a continued exciting development. And I've, I've, I've returned to spina bifida care frequently uh, in recent years. I continue to come to my faculty members on vacation. Uh, four, to five year old, uh, four to five years ago, I traveled to Eastern Uganda. Uh, to the CURE International Hospital where Dr. Benjamin Worf from Boston Children's developed the shuntless endoscopic third ventriculostomy and choroid plexus uh, coagulation, ETV, CBC uh, surgery to treat hydrocephalus. And there I was able to further develop uh, the general pediatric and rehabilitation care for these children in Eastern Africa who were surviving uh, with uh, spina bifida uh, into the uh, adult years. And uh, David's clinical and research focus on myelodysplasia really has made a difference in the lives of children with spina bifida. And my clinical interest over the years has increasingly focused on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I helped develop the Cooperative International Neuromuscular Research Group, or Synergy Network, uh, which in part originally patterned after uh, David's uh, IMSG uh, group. And this collaboration was, uh, has carried out natural history studies in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, clinical endpoint development and validation, biomarker validation, and more recently, over the past 16 years, we conducted uh, precision medicine clinical trials of gene-targeted therapeutics in, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, and I have uh, authored uh, over 230 peer-reviewed articles since my original 1986 publication with David 
And this international collaboration with hundreds of colleagues has had great impact uh, on the treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, and um, I was able to be involved in, in recent approvals of five uh, precision medicine gene therapy based therapeutics for um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And one month ago, I was fortunate to be one of two uh, physicians to present data to the FDA advisory committee on the first AAV gene therapy for the treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And it looks like June 22nd, uh, the PATUFA date uh, for that therapy five days from now will likely bring forth the first FDA uh, AAV gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy for a, a, a clinical population of younger uh, four to five year old patients. Uh, and uh, I think we'll likely see Duchenne added to the mandated newborn screening in the U.S. in the next uh, few years. I think we all learn the importance of prevention and early treatment of childhood disabilities from David's pioneering work on prenatal cesarean section. Uh, and really, just to conclude, there's really no one that has impacted my career uh, more than David Shirtleff. He's in impacted my decision to pursue a career in medicine, my focus on children with special needs. <laughs> He was a role model for prioritization of family, collaborative work, service play, compassionate care, and mentoring. Uh, and the value I place on advocacy and it is in large part due to my experience with Cynthia and David uh, working together. And I learned uh, also the importance of international collaboration from David. Uh, and really based on David as a role model, I, I developed a passion for the journey of clinical research. Uh, with a sufficient uh, focus uh, on a, a group of patients uh, where we could uh, really make a difference. And so thank you, David. I, I will be forever uh, indebted to you. I look forward to seeing you in person uh, soon when I travel back to Seattle to visit my mother who exposed me to your, to your teaching almost uh, 50 years ago. So uh, thank you very much. The three of us had many, many, many discussions about this over the last year. And at one of our little meetings, Bill said, shouldn't we have a little token of our esteem for the speakers? And Jeff said, it should have something to do with fishing. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, well, you know more about fishing than we do. <laughs> so <laughs> I went to the store and bought lures. <laughs> and the lures say thank you for your participation in really in the life work of David and Cynthia Shirtlin. And I'll tell you one more thing before I give all of the speakers lures. I wanted to do this at lunch because I'm not sure you're all going to stay all day. Um, when I went to check out and I put all these lures on the table, the woman said, well, those are for fish and those are for squid. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And she said, well, you fish for those during the day and you fish for those at night. And I said, yeah. And she said, so? I said, well, these fishermen work all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much. We've had a, a great morning. I think people have had a great time, and again, just at, at lunch for people to be able to share and, and reflect on some of the stories. We've had some some trainees, two trainees already, uh, comment uh, about their experience and, and what they learned from from David and Cynthia. And so I want to introduce uh, Emily Myers, uh, who is a clinical associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of Adult Medicine. Uh, she's been involved in the division since her medical school days, maybe before. Undergrad. 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 Okay. Could not remember there. Did a residency in Chicago, came back and did her fellowship with us, and we were very fortunate in having her join the faculty uh, in 2013. She's currently the clinical director of the, of the, director of the clinical training unit over at the now at IHDB. Uh, she has been instrumental in expanding those programs and building many of those bridges that I talked about this morning. Uh, to other services that can that recognize the value of developmental input into their patient care. Uh, she's also the director of the fellowship program, which I talked a little bit about this morning. Uh, she has been able to consistently recruit fellows uh, in, in a competitive market where probably over half the programs go empty uh, and has integrated the key principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion into that, including having a family member as part of the interview process for potential fellows. Um, 
while she's uh, tremendous in all of these uh, responsibilities and, and opportunities, depending on what time of the week it is, um, I think she also is an exceptional uh, clinician. And I wanted to, to read this. It was a comment from one of her families. Because I'm not even sure how to put into words with incredible, thorough, compassionate, understanding, knowledgeable, all-around wonderful doctor and person Dr. Myers is. We had very high expectations to begin with, but she exceeded them beyond that. That's certainly always been my experience with Emily, and we've been great friends for a good long time. And so let me introduce Emily Myers to you and, and her thoughts. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, everybody. I recognize so many of you. Um, I've been thinking for probably about a month and a half about how best I can put into words the feelings that I have for Dr. Shirtlet and Cynthia Shirtlet um, and how they've impacted my life. And I, I speak specifically to my life because it extends beyond my career, which is a huge part of it, but not the whole part of it. Um, when I was in undergrad and I was chasing after Jeff McLaughlin and Sterling Claren dying to be a developmental pediatrician, which is the reason why I went to school to become a doctor in the first place. I had the opportunity to sit in on our teaching rounds, which have been around for a really long time, Thursday morning, 9 o'clock, if any of you want to join. It's by Zoom right now. Chuck, it'll be in person soon. Um, and I sat in the back always because I was intimidated. and. Dr. Shirtleth was always there. And what I learned from him, and so I would go, I, I went to undergrad on the East Coast, but I, every time I'd come back on vacation, I would come to rounds. And then when I did my residency in Chicago, I would come back on vacation and I would come to rounds. I literally stocked this place until I became a fellow here. Um, and I would come to rounds and I would sit in the back and I would listen to what people had to say. And what I heard from <clears throat> David has stayed with me forever. And the, the, the lesson I learned from him during those times was don't let technology replace your brain. <laughs> that a really good history and a really good exam can tell you almost everything you need to know when you're trying to take care of a patient. And then, miraculously, I got into fellowship here. And it was at a time in David's career where he was stepping back, still seeing patients, but leaning away from administrative medicine and clinical medicine and, and moving on. And it was a really wonderful time to be a part of his life as a trainee, and it was the first time I had the opportunity to do that. And I got to work with him in the <clears throat> Flex Clinic and see patients with him. And what I learned in that moment was beyond the history and the physical, it was the relationship that you made with the family and the patient that lasted longer than all the medical decisions that you make for somebody. And his ability to connect with his patients and the parents of his patients extends was infinite and so valuable and it was really an inspiration to me as a clinician and as a future developmentalist <clears throat> so his gift were those things those just some of those things the bigger gift he gave me was his wife <laughs> So when I was a fellow, he trusted me enough to drive his wife down to Olympia on several occasions to work with the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Washington chapter, to advocate on Capitol Hill. I was terrified. I was terrified because I never worked with state legislators before or politicians. I didn't know what to say or how to engage in a way that was meaningful and impactful in those kinds of settings. And Cynthia, I remember the first time she took me down, I remember exactly what she was wearing. She had on knee-high boots and a really sharp-looking skirt and jacket, and we were walking through the Capitol, and the seas 
would just part for her. Everybody knew who she was. She was the most influential human being within a 20 yard space at any given moment in the Capitol at any one time. And I just followed right on behind her like this. What do I do? Until she turned around and she put her arm around me and shoved me forward into a meeting room and said, you can do it. That mentorship, that trust that she had in me that I had a voice that mattered in a state level was something I've never gotten from anybody else and was absolutely one of the most cherished moments I have of my career. The other part that I cherished about working with Cynthia were the drives back and forth to Olympia where I got to hear all about how David asked her out on her first on the first date and she pushed him down a hill said no pushed him down a hill and the smile she had when she said it and the relationship that she was talking she spoke so warmly of about their partnership both in family and in career and the advocacy that they did together which to me was so incredible to see a professional and personal partnership work so well it was truly incredible. And I got to see, I was, I think, one of the last fellows to go to Day Bob with my daughter and my husband. My daughter was 12 months old at the time. And be part of that experience and connection to, um, connection to the canal and to Puget Sound and the Pacific Northwest. It just, everything about them as a couple speaks to how rooted they are into the community, both on a personal level and professional level, and they allowed trainees like me to be a part of both worlds, which was so generous and open. And so I'm so, the lessons I've learned from David and Cynthia are lifelong and extend beyond the clinical room and impact how I interface and interact with my trainees and also my family and the community. And I couldn't be more grateful for them. So thank you so much.